lecture, Forget the bun, I got a baby in the oven. Jonathan Swift and a Modest Proposal. Without any historical context, this essay is lost on the reader. It just sounds like a crazy guy arguing to eat babies. So what I'm going to do is try to give you that context, an understanding of what satire is, and then dive into how all of that plays out in Swift's A Modern Proposal. Okay, so Jonathan Swift is technically Irish, but he was raised in England, ended up working for an English diplomat, and used his library to further his pretty well-rounded education. He became a member of the clergy and ended up being stationed as Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. And while there, he journeyed around the city and saw how the Irish poor were being treated. Ireland was dependent on England, and England wanted to keep it that way. England took everything worthwhile from Ireland, and because they were ruling them, they didn't have to trade anything for it. We're just going to take this because, well, you know, it's ours now. Well, all of that was, all that was left for the Irish to eat were potatoes. Okay, well, that might be a little extreme, the only thing. But really, I, other than cat and rat, I would want to eat potatoes too because it's the easiest thing that, to come by. And it, of course, it gives you nourishment. So if that's the only thing they have to eat, you can guess what happens next. The potato famine which also was called the Great Famine, despite it being anything but great. I mean, come on, it's like calling World War II the awesome sequel. So all the Irish poor had to eat were potatoes, and soon after, the potatoes were stricken with rot. The entire harvest and stock were rotting faster than the, uh, the poor could save them. And it's at this time the Eng that England was having the Irish export their food, the English soldiers would guard the food stock as it was being carted past starving Irish families, farmers, and homeless children, and it's being sent to be sold for profit that went right into English pockets. It's at the same time that when England was taking all of the food out of the hands of babes and exporting all of the saleable commodities, it was then that England decided to raise the taxes on the Irish. The people were so poor, and this is true, that some were selling their five-year-old daughters into prostitution for a penny. This was the Ireland that Swift saw. And he goes back and forth between England and Ireland, visiting both the English and Irish governments, suggesting solutions that would begin to fix the problem of the Irish poor. Suggestions like taxing absentee landowners who were primarily English, to encourage Irish industries, to improve the land, agricultural techniques, and the quality of manufactured goods, they were all rejected. And Swift realizes that England benefited from keeping the Irish under their thumb. He also saw that the Irish were so used to being passive that they knew no other way of living. So while not totally on board with the plan, the poor felt powerless and resigned. Swift realized he had to find a way to ignite the passion in the Irish poor and wake up those English allies and academic essays being submitted have not succeeded. He had to find another way. Enter satire. Satire, at its most basic form, is saying one thing and meaning the other. Saturday Night Live, South Park, The Simpsons, The Onion, even your lunch table conversation sometimes, satire is present. It's so part of our daily life, and as such, sometimes it makes it difficult to recognize the components that are involved. So, to break them down into six common most pieces, we've got one, irony. The actual intent is expressed in words that carry the opposite meaning. It's lighter and less harsh than sarcasm, though more cutting because of its indirectness. The ability to recognize irony is one of the surest tests of intelligence and sophistication. Irony speaks words of praise to imply blame, and words of blame to imp imply praise. 
writer is using a tongue-in-cheek style. Irony is achieved through such techniques as hyperbole and understatement. The second thing is travesty. This presents a serious, oftentimes religious subject frivolously. It reduces everything to the lowest form. If you break down the word, you have trans, meaning over, across, meaning vestir, to clothe or dress, presenting a subject in a dress or a way intended for another type of subject. For example, Monty Python's Life of Brian. The third thing is burlesque. It's ridiculous exaggeration achieved through a variety of ways. For example, the sublime may be absurd, honest emotions may be turned into sentimentality. The most essential quality of burlesque is style. A style ordinary di ordinarily dignified may be used for nonsensical matters. Fourth, parody. A composition imitating or burlesquing another usually serious piece of work. Parody ridicules in nonsensical fashion an original piece of work. Parody in literature is what the caricature in cartoon is to art. Airplane and scary movie series are a great example. The fifth thing is understatement. It's taking a real life situation and reducing it to make it ridiculous and showcase its faults. Like, giving the nickname Tiny to the 350-pound man, or describing him as not the smallest guy in the room, that's an understatement. Or, Oedipus had a problem, that's an understatement. And finally, six, exaggeration. Exciting laughter through exaggerated, improbable situations. This often contains low comedy, like quarreling, fighting, of course, with horseplay, noisy singing, boisterous conduct, trickery, clownishness, drunkenness, and slapstick. Let me give you an example. When I was a student at Holy Ghost, there was an underground newspaper. It was student-run and student-published, and the faculty did not know who or how it was done. Remember, this was pre-Snapchat. But they did make a big deal about it because they knew it was all in good fun. It was full of satire, but a lot of it was lost on the faculty. There was a student who wrote for this newspaper that was annoyed with how the dances in the lower gym had become just a massive sweaty mob of hormonal teenagers. It was no longer fun because you had to try and pass through this mob to do anything. He would be walking and all of a sudden he would find himself in the middle of you know, a grinding session. So he wrote an article about how, since we have this problem, that we should section off an area of the dance for activities of a certain nature. He was very detailed in the pros of this, including cleanliness and safety and protection. Well, needless to say, it didn't go over well. The entire point of it was lost on the, admin the administration, and luckily, they never did find out who that student was. All of these same elements are seen throughout Swift's essay. Let's get one thing straight. Swift did not want the Irish to eat their babies. He didn't want anyone to eat babies. He wasn't serious. Well, he is serious about the outrage at the problem, wanting the English to stop raping the country and for the Irish to get off, up the, up off their butts and demand justice. But he is mocking those who propose incomplete solutions while ignoring those that would actually work. He uses the elements of burlesque and parody to mock the form of writing and those who are in power. Look at even the voice he uses. Swift takes the pr on a persona, and it's, that is definitely a word you want to remember. Persona meaning that he writes as if he were this guy that we call the proposer. It, persona is like taking on a mask. Look at how he writes, how he is cold and calculating, how he basically acts as an accountant, adding up the figures of the poor as if they were cattle or some other commodity. I mean, come on, he even refers to them as breeders. He references how one male can serve four females. 
He parodies and exaggerates how the people of power talk and view the people they take advantage of. The final thought I want to leave you is this. It works. Even though it is disturbing, his solution, at least on paper, works. It solves the problem of poverty by taking 120,000 mouths to feed out of the equation. It provides a commodity that the poor can produce themselves. They can even use the hide to make even more commodities. They can create specialized jobs like glove makers and boot makers. And really, who doesn't need a good pair of Tims made out of real baby Tim? A Chelsea boot made out of genuine Chelsea. Some Mary Janes made out of, okay, you get it. It helps them economically. It even solves the domestic issues. No longer will husbands beat their wives, for now they will fear they'll lose a profit. Mothers will no longer abort fetuses or murder their newborn babies, because now they can gain money after them. Because after a year, they know the family no longer has to care for the little buggers. One benefit you might have missed is the fact that this solution solves a religious problem too. Catholics. They make up the majority of the poor, and if we eat them, no more Catholics. Church of Ireland prevails. Swift has solved the problem of the Irish poor. Wait, what? What's that you say? It's immoral? You can't eat babies? You want to speak about morality? Which is more immoral? Eating a baby when it's one years old and it knows nothing about the world, has felt no pain of poverty, or to let it grow up in the streets and if it be a girl, let her be raped at five years old for money, take away their means of business, means of life, means of survival, and then when they are adults begging for alms, blame them for not succeeding in life, for not pulling themselves up by their bootstraps when you have taken away their boots. Tell me. Which is more immoral? Now, Swift is not actually arguing for baby fricassee, but because he uses this extremely exaggerated solution, he never has to come out and say the obvious. The people of power have done something terrible and have not done anything to solve it, and those who have been undermined have let themselves become complacent. And you know what? We can read this and it still makes sense. In World Lit, you know, we have a lot of fun mostly reading about guys who marry their moms or rip off a monster's arm or go mad with power. And all of that can be connected to our modern lives, sure. But here we have something different, something applicable. A study in 2016 of the homeless epidemic in the United States found that 564,708 people in the U.S. are homeless, with almost 100,000 of those being chronically homeless. Just in Philadelphia alone, in 2015, homeless outreach organizations engaged over 6,500 individuals living on the streets, in cars, abandoned buildings, trains, bus stations, and other places not meant for human habitation. What do we do with them? What do you do with them? Feeling bad doesn't do anything. Tossing a dollar in a cup solves nothing. Why don't we eat them? You're right. That is wrong. It's too extreme. So why don't we help them? Why don't we help them by making policy? That is what Swift was arguing for.